few years ago when the pandemic swept its way across the world, it completely upended the entire global economy. Cruise lines and buffet restaurants folded. While the companies that produced webcams, sourdough yeast, and elastic pants surged into unprecedented prosperity. One of the greatest economic success stories of the pandemic years, however, was the New York Times Games Division, whose subscription rates skyrocketed during the months when we were all confined to our homes. Like many of you, I played a lot of those games during the lockdown. I did the Wordle every day, along with some of the off-brand variations like Quartle, where you can guess four words at a time, or Octwordle, where you can guess eight. There's a music game called Hurdle and a, a math game called Nerdle, and uh, an impossible to pronounce geography variation called Worldle. But the one that I stuck with day after day was the crossword. I was doing the Times crossword occasionally before COVID, but once we went into lockdown, I became completely obsessed. I logged on every night as soon as the next day's puzzle dropped, and I never missed a day. And I still have it, more than a thousand puzzles later. A few months in, I decided that I wanted to try my hand at a new challenge that required a whole new set of skills. That looks pretty good. I decided I wanted to try not just solving crosswords, but building them. I've been working on it for a few months now, and I'm still not very good, but I've learned a few things along the way, and I want to share some of them with you tonight. What I hope you'll see is the potential in these lessons to help us prepare ourselves spiritually for the year that is just about to begin. A crossword grid is a beautiful thing. A simple structure with a rigid and uncompromising architecture of soaring, liberatory possibility. When you sit down to start building, you face the imposing presence of an unyielding array of vacant squares, stretching out horizontally and vertically, tantalizing you, inviting you, begging you to fill them up with anything. That's the first challenge you face when you're building a puzzle, how to decide what's going to go in there. It's the challenge of every creator in every medium, every artist gripped by paralysis when he stares at a blank canvas, an empty sheet of music staff paper, a cursor pulsing on an empty document. What will go in there? You can build a crossword around just about any kind of theme you can imagine, kinds of food or names of countries, animals or composers or Academy Award winners, anything you can dream of. When you first sit down with a blank grid in front of you, you can fill it with anything you want. But there are a finite number of squares to work with. 225. Every weekday, 15 across by 15 down. 21 by 21 on Sundays. That's it. So you have to start by making choices. What will you let in and what will you keep out? There's another element of the structure of crossword grids that I never really fully appreciated before I started trying to build them, the black squares. Putting them into place is as much an exercise in artistry as dropping the words and letters into the white squares. All the words fit together seamlessly and harmoniously, but it's the black squares that make a grid beautiful. And the placement of those black squares is one of our lessons for this new year. It is an important but maybe surprising truth that restraint and limitation are the things that allow creativity to flourish. Growth is made possible through the deliberate act of making room for emptiness. The space between the notes, the open air in which sound reverberates, the pauses between brush strokes, 
when the painter steps back to appraise his work and allow it to breathe. These are the places where art is made. We need empty space in our lives, too, for rest and rejuvenation. Without regular breaks, everything becomes overwhelming and exhausting. No matter how busy we are, we must set aside unstructured time to replenish our finite resources. And we Jews were the ones who came up with that. In the ancient world, the very idea of a day when you didn't have to work was completely unheard of before our ancestors gave birth to the concept called Shabbat. There's deep wisdom in the recognition that a non-negotiable, regularly scheduled day of rest is critical for human flourishing. And the world owes some gratitude to the Jews for having invented their weekend. And once the black squares are placed, you're set free to begin filling in the words and to decide what will be left in and what will be kept out. You need to be principled and discerning. It's an exercise in blending rigor and creativity. What goals do you want to prioritize? What feels most exciting at this moment? What feels most urgent? How will you make space for the things you want to do while still keeping an eye on the things you need to do? Let's see the next slide, please. There they are. Think hard, make good choices, and stick to them. Now, I'm not arguing that you should be rigid or uncompromising, just the opposite. On the page and in our lives, balance is what's key. It's not just the long, flashy, superstar words that make a puzzle shine, words that make people ooh and ah, like used car and ukulele, like arsenal and sadists and flatworm. Instead, a finished product that is elegant and beautiful comes from a thoughtful blend. Some solid, crunchy words mixed with soft, fluffy filler to pad the edges. It's a valuable skill to be able to curate that kind of mixture in our lives, too. Balancing work with play, the comfort of solitude, and the warmth of community, the rigor of personal maintenance, and the soothing recognition of the gifts and blessings that are already ours. Now, the last and most important lesson of crossword construction, it's the same lesson that we have to learn in a lot of other parts of our lives too. When we're starting a new job, a new hobby, whenever we're figuring out how to do something for the first time, we must expect to fail a lot. I'll admit that this one was a particularly hard one for me to accept. I don't like to fail. I don't like to screw up. I don't like to feel like I'm not good at something. But the process of building a crossword puzzle, especially when you're new at it, requires a lot of trial and error and a lot of frequent demoralizing failure. That's a necessary part of the process. You have to figure out how to be comfortable using your eraser or even throwing away something that just isn't going to work. It's difficult, but it is so important. You have to learn to love what it feels like to fail. Because unless you make peace with the fact that you are susceptible to error, you'll never arrive at anything like real success. The goal is to develop a kind of ego elasticity, a sense of self that is supple and flexible. Real enlightenment only arrives when you're sitting in a posture of gentleness with your work and with yourself. You may have heard the line that was attributed to Thomas Edison when he was hard at work at some invention or another in his workshop. I have not failed, he said. I've just discovered 10,000 ways that don't work. <laughs> the moment you realize that the project you're working on isn't going to come together the way you thought is not a moment of failure. It's the flash of discovery that you're making something 
different than you thought you were before. Of course, developing comfort with our own failure is easier said than done. In crossword puzzles and in the rest of our lives, too, it helps to pause frequently along the way to take a wide-angle view of how far we've come before we start moving forward again. Sometimes shifting our view just by a couple of degrees breaks the log jam and opens up a new perspective that makes everything suddenly come together. Well, I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to figure out how to build a good crossword puzzle, and I'm still trying to figure out how to build the kind of life I hope to live. This is the case for all of us in one way or another. All of us, I hope, are engaged in an ongoing effort to make something worthwhile with our time on Earth. We're all continually building and demolishing, revising and reconsidering. The work of this season calls us to focus our vision on the great construction project inside ourselves, to recommit ourselves to build lives of consequence, lives that are pleasing in the eyes of God and our fellow human beings. And tonight, we start fresh. These holy days issue us their wake-up call, and we will answer it. Tonight, we stand before the wide open grid of a brand new year, and tonight, we start to build. Let us fill it with meaning and purpose, with the strategic and principled process of deciding what we will let in and what we will keep out. Let's make a point of leaving some empty space unfilled, where activity can be balanced with replenishment and rest. And lastly, let us find comfort with our mistakes and our failures as we make our way through these days of awe, as we examine our deeds, atone for those which have hurt others, and strengthen those which bring healing and wholeness. My friends, I hope that this year will be a time of great renewal for all of us and those we love. May we find in it new opportunities for discovery, new appreciation for our place in the world, and renewed gratitude for the power that is in our hands to build a future in which every empty space, down and across and every which way, is filled with sweetness, joy, and peace. L'shana tova. May it be a year of goodness for us all. Amen.